Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. So this is week 13 and we are reading chapter 12, which is about modern China. And I'm probably going to go way off script here as I normally do. But um, one surprise for you is that we are scheduled to have a quiz this week and we're not going to have it. Uh, so I'll figure out the points, but uh, let's just skip the quiz for this week. I don't really think we need to take another quiz. So um, we're going to talk about China. And if you remember back in chapter 7, uh, I think what had happened was that uh, the nationalist under Chiang Kai-shek and the communist under Mao Zedong were in this civil war. And hopefully at the end of that chapter, um, we all knew that the communists took over China in 1949. And maybe we remember a little bit about uh, Mao Zedong's technique for this communist takeover, which was basically to appeal to the peasants because it was such a... Uh, a large country with so many peasants and very agrarian. So that was sort of his deal. So um, Mao comes into office, and instead of modeling this uh, command and control structure that, that Lenin and Stalin had done um, in the Soviet Union in their, in their conversion to communism, if you will, um, Mao also had similar plans to do that, but I guess uh, took it a little slower in that uh, I think Mao and, and actually all of the leaders after him knew that there had to be uh, some opportunity for uh, private investment or private innovation. And, and the main driving factor for that, especially as we get into the late 70s, is that uh, China knew to be a player on the world stage, they need, to have, they need to have foreign investment and they needed to be able to learn about foreign technologies because one of the issues with China, all the way back to the Chinese empire, everything we've read about since uh, whenever we started this, 1900, uh, you know, China was a, a very close society, which is cool if you want to kind of control your people, but it's not cool if you want to see what's going on in the outside world from a standpoint of technology. So, um, whether it's it's Chairman Mao or um, um, you know anyone else after Chairman Mao, you're going to see this this idea that hey, we're socialist in the way that uh, we view our one political party, and we're socialist in our ideology, but really in their economy, they take a very uh, capitalist. They'll never call it that because it's a bad word, but they take on a very capitalist. Um, um, model, in other words, because I think that the Chinese learned, again, these two things, that if you wanted innovation, you had to let uh, plant managers, and and even if these industries are government controlled, you had to let plant managers um, run a company, whether it's a factory or, or a high-tech internet company, you had to let them run it in, in sort of a Western style so, so they could innovate and then compete on the world stage, because after all, that's what China needed to do to build up their economy was at one point to compete on the world stage. I mean, it would, you know, China wasn't blind. So obviously, you know, they knew what was going on in Japan after World War II. Japan, you know, built up very quickly. South Korea, you know, built up real quickly. That was a little later. But, but anyway, the point was that I think, I think every Chinese leader realized that we can't stay uh, insular for very long because we need the technology, we need the business. And in order to uh, expand as a superpower, quite frankly, you need to be a marketing superpower. And the only one that ever existed before China was the U.S. And again, getting off track, that was one of the problems with the USSR. They never made cool stuff. I mean, they made terrible things. So, you know, they never established a world following. And I think the Chinese realized that they needed to do that. But let's get back to Ch uh, Chairman Mao because I'm I'm drifting way off, but I, but I think I want to have some continuity to the story so you guys can understand how this uh, country, you know, has this communist revolution and then ends up, you know, pretty, uh, pretty much a capitalist society, whether they'd like to admit it or not. So that, I'm sorry to go off track. But anyway, under, under Mao and his plans and his, his sort of idea of gradualism uh, in a conversion to communism, you know, like Stalin, like all of, you know, all of these communist dictators, they have these great plans and they give them, they brand them, you know, they give them great names to get the people behind them. So, um, you know, one of them Chairman Mao had after, after taking over China and sort of slowly building these uh, collectivist communes out in the country, um, he came up with a, with a, which failed. And then he came up with a program called the Great Leap Forward. And, and that was, 
Um, um, that was a, a massive recollectivization. In other words, the government uh, seizes you know all the private property. They create these uh, agricultural collectives. And you'll read about it in the book, but under the Great Leap Forward, which was the great program that was supposed to save Chairman Mao, 15 million peasants died of starvation. And I mean, they would do stuff like that. They would just go to an agricultural collective and say, hey, guess what? You're not growing rice this year. You're, you're doing this instead and not really uh, compensating for you know, weather issues or crop issues. So, so the Great Leap, Leap Forward was a, a real disaster under, under Chairman Mao, and you can read about it. Um, so I did my master's thesis actually on a, a really narrow slice of, of Chinese history, and I, I don't pretend to be an expert at all. Um, but um, my master's thesis was about ping pong diplomacy, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But what I also want to mention to you is since I did study Chairman Mao to some extent, um, he, was a, he was a very interesting guy. I mean, he was uh, very charismatic to the people, and he was viewed as someone of great wisdom by most people. And uh, like he had... Um, Everybody in China had the, their little red book, all right, a little a, a pocket, a pocket paperback, if you will, a little red book, and it was full of uh, Chairman Mao's sayings. You know, he was always famous for these little sayings. You know, not like you know, make America great again, but 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 that sort of thing. And and so um, he had this um, a cult of personality that really built, and and he always had a lot of revolutionaries behind him. And, and he was a lifelong revolutionary. And as his compatriots and other people in the Communist Party, you know, sort of became less revolutionary and more comfortable with their positions, Mao was the one that always knew that he had to keep things stirred up to remain popular. And, and the reason it plays into my uh, thesis when I was a, a master's student, and again, I'm sorry this video is going to go so long, but Chairman Mao always had a problem of staying popular in his country because these great programs like the Great Leap Forward, you know, would inevitably fail and you'd have, you know, 20 million starving peasants. And, you know, in this communist party where the people don't elect the leaders, there's all this infighting and you never know when you're going to kind of get knocked off. So uh, Mao was very paranoid about holding on to his power. And what he did every time he had trouble in society. So if, if there was a bunch of people starving and, and they were upset and trying to protest, or if, if someone tried to take over in an insurrection, he would always create a new incident, all right? He'd create a new thing to divert attention from these social problems that were going on. He was really good at that. So I remember when, when I was studying about him, uh, there's two islands off of China and they're always disputed between uh, Japan and China. I think not that part's not important. Mitsoi and I don't remember the other one at this point. But you know, anytime there was like social unrest, um, you know, Mao would come out and say, "Hey, the capitalists are trying to take over these islands," and they would shoot all of these shells at these islands. No one lived there; it's just you know, just small islands where no one lived. But he was he would always kind of uh, you know um, uh, create an incident to divert society away from their real problems. Problems. And one of the things he created was something called the Cultural Revolution. And again, this was just sort of uh, something he made up in a sense, but the Cultural Revolution was sort of um, reverse McCarthyism. Okay, And by that I mean he came out and claimed, hey, there are capitalists among us, these terrible capitalists, and we have to purge the system of capitalists, and we have to purge the system of the old ways. So what he did with the um, with the Cultural Revolution was, you know, he stirred up all of these young people, um, created this, um, this, this uh, police force called the Red Guard, which was mostly young people. And um, there is a, um, there's a little snippet in, uh, in the book on page 302, and I want you to read it. It's called Make Revolution. And it's a story of some of these young men who are brainwashed by Mao, basically, who um, come into uh, Nanqing's home. She was a, a wife of a diplomat or a government leader. And, you know, they, they destroy all of her stuff because they say, hey, 
you know, this is representative of the old way and we're here for revolution. And she even pulls out the old uh, Chinese constitution under the nationalist and they tear it up and say, hey, we're communists now. So that's a like less than half a page. Read that. It's really interesting. It's on page 302. But but the point is that Chairman Mao, every time he got in trouble so with social problems, you know, he would create a thing. So um, switch to a little of American history here because this is kind of cool. At the same time, um, uh, uh, President Nixon was in office in the U.S. and he was always having trouble. His first term uh, was riddled with protest, you know, the, the ending of Vietnam, all of this stuff going on. And Nixon, by and large, did the same thing in the U.S. Every time there was trouble about Vietnam, he would say, hey, you know, we just came up with the, the you know, the Clean Air Act. So always trying to divert from the social problems in the U.S. by creating something new. Nixon was famous for that. And, and, and the reason um, that, that both of those things matter and the way they came together was in 1971. So you're going to watch a five-minute video on something called ping-pong diplomacy, but it's what I wrote my master's thesis on. And what ping-pong diplomacy uh, refers to is an incident in 1971 where, um, and then the Chinese are like totally into ping pong, all right? They view it as like a communist sport because anyone can do it. I should have told you that first. They're way into ping pong and they always have been. Well, in the World Ping Pong Championships, I think in 1970, which were in Japan, one of the American players who, you know, has the whole 70s, you know, mullet cut and the whole deal, uh, one of the U.S. players misses the flight, like back to the U.S. So he's stranded in Japan and and befriends the Chinese communist ping pong team. I don't know how they communicate. I, I did at the time. I forgot some of my research now. But um, but anyway, this American's left behind with the Chinese ping pong team, and they strike up this friendship. And it gets some press in the U.S. And it gets um, it, it gets to Chairman Mao, and they learn about this um, uh, accidental friendship between these ping pong players. And um, Mao and Nixon, through back channels, uh, get together and start to talk about having a ping pong tournament between uh, the Chinese nationals and the U.S. team. Now, the reason this is a big deal, because after China went communist in 1949, the U.S. never talked to him again. So there was no interaction between China and the U.S., no uh, substantive diplomacy of any kind um, between 1949 and 1971. And because Chairman Mao was struggling at home uh, for popularity and Nixon was, was in the middle of Watergate at this time, um, the, they, both those leaders, I think, you know, or my thesis was that they both thought it was a good idea to have this uh, Chinese USA ping pong tournament as sort of the opening salvo of what, what was referred to as a reprochement, which is, you know, getting back together again, reapproaching. That's a French word. So, um, so you know, through back channels, Nixon and Mao arranged this uh, ping pong tournament, and it's like the biggest thing ever. So that happens in 1971, and there's a little video, but it's cool because because of that ping pong tournament and the way it opened up relations between China and the U.S., Nixon Nixon actually goes to China. Henry Kissinger is involved. All of these you know really famous you know U.S. diplomats. Uh, Nixon actually goes to China to meet Chairman Mao, and what comes out of that is one of the first business relationships. I think Weyerhaeuser and Boeing, you know, both got like deals through China right after that visit, which was a year or two after the ping pong tournament. So ping pong diplomacy was a real thing, and it's fascinating. And there's a five minute video I want you to watch uh, over it because it's kind of a cool, fun story in history. So there's that part. Um, and then, um, I, I know I'm going too long here. I'm up to like 13 minutes. Um, Chairman Mao dies in, uh, 1976. Uh, Deng Xiaoping takes over a really hardcore communist again. And, you know, Mao's, Chairman Mao's wife and like two or three people that were in his cabinet, you know, were all sentenced to death after, uh, Deng gets in the office. Cause that's kind of the way they do it over there, or at least the way they did it. And, and, so under Deng, there's this new thing called the Four Modernizations, and it's a program for the government to uh, focus on, um, uh, on four things, so industry, agriculture, technology, and defense. So that's sort of where Deng comes in. And so China begins 
modernization, uh, relations are opened with the U.S. to some extent after Nixon's visit. So, you know, now there's some foreign investment, and and China is slowly becoming a uh, a global player in the marketplace, if you will. So, and I, you know, we know how that turns out because they're massive right now. You know, they're making like you know my iPhone or whatever. So, um, pretty much everything. So, um, so we we understand that piece. But the other piece we need to understand is like, okay, you know, we kind of know that we know that China is communist or like there's just one political party and it's the Communist Party and it runs everything. So we know that's the case. And we obviously all know that China is a economic and manufacturing and tech powerhouse that, you know, who knows, may take over the world someday. I don't know. But we obviously know that that um, under this idea of the four modernizations that industry and technology and defense also um, really takes off. But the, the part that's harder for us to understand is what is it like to be a Chinese person? What's it like to be a Chinese student? Can you have radical ideas? How do they keep the people in line considering there's no real elections, um, as it were? And to understand that, or maybe to confuse us even more, we need to learn about Tiananmen Square. So um, the Tiananmen Square incident, I want you to uh, learn about. And in order to do that, you're going to watch a 28-minute long video. I know that's a lot, but I want you to see it because I think, well, first of all, the video you're going to see, any video about Tiananmen Square is totally banned in China. They've wiped it off their history books. Uh, you can get arrested and you can actually get sent to prison for talking about the Tiananmen Square protests. So I think it's interesting uh, that that's the case, but that is still a thing that's forbidden to talk about in China. So the video you guys are going to watch, which is produced by Al Jazeera, it doesn't matter who it's produced by, um, any video about uh, uh, Tiananmen Square would be banned in China. So certainly the video you're going to watch would be banned in China. And it's a, it's a long video, I apologize, but it's a, it's a video that was produced. Um, it's, a, it's a documentary, and it will show you what happened uh, in 89 in Tiananmen Square, and this huge, ginormous student movement happens, these protests, and it gets so, I mean, there's like a million people, and it, and it gets so big in Beijing that um, uh, Deng, eventually, Deng Xiaoping at that point, you know, decides, hey, we got to clear these people out. So it's a fascinating story. I mean, they, they send the army in against all these students and, you know, the students are feeding the, the soldiers and giving them cigarettes and trying to, you know, do the whole peace and love thing, which works kind of for a little while. But then uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, gives the order to clear the streets. And I think, um, I think the Chinese army shot, uh, you can't get the real numbers. This documentary says they killed 2,600 people and uh, official Chinese um, official Chinese history says that 200 were killed and like 60 of them were soldiers or something. But but the real number is closer to between two and 3,000 people, students, uh, mowed down by automatic weapons when they wouldn't clear the square, many of them getting run over by tanks. Um, and, and all of the news footage that you see was snuck out of Tiananmen Square uh, because it was, you know, it wasn't digital, it was... Um, tape then, videotape. It was, it was snuck out of uh, Tiananmen Square to Hong Kong, where then it was uh, given to the Western world. So everything you're seeing, uh, you may have seen before, it's out there, uh, but it's so tightly censored because uh, China never want, wants anyone to know that it happened. But the point is, the reason I want you to understand it, and I'd love it if you guys could watch it all the way through, and I know there's like four or five ads you have to click through, so I apologize, but I would love it if you would click through because I think for most of you, um, you know, you're so much younger than I am for sure, uh, something else is going to happen in China at some point in time. Uh, there's going to be some sort of revolution, maybe, but I think if you understand Tiananmen Square, when that time comes and when you're watching it on the news, it will give you a better understanding of sort of the background. And I think that we should all be aware of what's going on in China. Um, and then I'll close with this last thing. So, you know, after you watch the Tiananmen Square thing and you're like, okay, what happened to the radical movement? Are there radicals there? You know, how do they, how do they push back? Obviously, when you read through the textbook, the cultural part, you, you know that 
Chinese is you know the Chinese kids and Chinese people are kind of hip. They're very modernized. Um, you know, they're a lot like you guys are. I mean, you know, all of electronics and you know dressing the way you want and whatever. So there's a lot of that going on. But but you have to ask yourself, you know, why is it cool for them to not have a, a democracy? And and one of the answers is, and I think you'll get a little bit out of it in the video. They don't know what democracy is. Uh, they live in a one-party communist party rule, and again, all the modern conveniences we have for those people that are fortunate enough to be in some middle class in in the city, um, you know, life isn't that much different between the two places. And I think one of the things that China's done really well to kind of keep people in check, especially after Tiananmen Square, is that they're no longer denouncing like material goods. And under the Communist Party. You know, everyone was supposed to have the same stuff. So, you know, you couldn't, you had to dress, everyone had to dress and wear the same thing. You know, everyone had the same radio, everyone had this. And, and it, this, this idea of gaining material goods or materialism was, was kind of uh, something that the communists like Mao wouldn't like that at all. But I think after Deng and a sort, uh, certainly under Xi, Jinping right now, uh, they've understood that, hey, if we give the people what they want, if we give them their iPhones and give them cars and give them uh, a little bit of incentive uh, to work or maybe manage their job in a certain way, then there's less chance that people are going to rise up and do another Tiananmen Square. And there's all kinds of theories about that, even through American history, where you know people always say that Americans will never rise up against their government in any serious way because we're too comfortable. You know, we have, you know, too much, I think the saying was, you know, we have too much uh, apple pie and, and roast beef, uh, you know, whoever, Warner Sumbart or somebody said that. So um, I think that's what's going on in China, but I want you to watch the Tiananmen Square thing. And um, my gift to you for watching a 28 minute video and even my 22 minute video is not having to take a quiz this week. So uh, that's where I'm at, that's what I'm thinking. Read through the chapter, uh, watch the two videos if you would, and we'll talk again next week. We're, we're winding down. We're going to be at the end of the semester in, what, two or three weeks. So every, everyone's doing great. Uh, thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye-bye.